Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to today's show, I want to let you know that we're offering our podcast listeners a special 20% lifetime discount to the China Africa Daily Brief. Now that's the newsletter that Cobus and I produce every day that provides the most comprehensive digest of everything China's doing on the continent and now increasingly throughout the global south. To get that discount, just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe and use the promo code podcast at checkout. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from sub-China. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to talk about infrastructure and what an incredibly strange time it is to be thinking about infrastructure in Africa. Now, there's a lot of interest out there talking about infrastructure. Almost every week now we hear these press conferences coming out of Washington, out of Brussels, out of London now about these new initiatives to compete with China and the Belt and Road to build infrastructure in the global south. And a lot of that focus is going to be in Africa. There, of course, is the Build Back Better World program and the Blue Dot Network. That thing is still around apparently, Cobus. There's the new $300 billion global gateway program from the European Union. Uh, Japan has its quality infrastructure initiative that's mostly focused on countries here in Southeast Asia. I hear the French are thinking about an infrastructure program. The British have talked about a $9 billion infrastructure initiative. Again, we don't know a lot of details about what's actually going on, how much of this is going to happen, when it's going to happen, and exactly how much is going to impact Africa. But what we do know is that the need in Africa is large and getting larger by the day. Remember, Kobus, we spoke earlier this year with the folks from Baker McKinsey, which is an international law firm. They published a report which showed how over the past five or six years, the funding for African infrastructure has plummeted. It went from $100 billion a year in deal values in 2014 to just $31 billion last year. And that situation is probably not going to improve this year or even next year, in part because it looks like China has pulled out of the large-scale infrastructure financing business that it has been dominant in in Africa and in many other parts of the global south, including Latin America, for much of the past 20 years. Um, We got some indications about that at the FOCAC conference that took place in Dakar, Senegal last week, and that wrapped up. And in the aftermath of that, we're getting some fantastic analysis that's now starting to come out about what happened at FOCAC. And there's a part of of an essay that came out today from Yun Sun, who's at the Brookings Institute in Washington. She's also the China Program Director at the Stimson Center there. And she wrote this very interesting essay, and I'd like to read an extract of that for you just to set the tone for our conversation today. Perhaps the most striking element of China's FOCAC commitment this year, she wrote, is the complete disappearance of infrastructure from the narrative. Indeed, throughout Xi Jinping's speech, the word infrastructure did not appear even once, a sharp contrast to the four direct references to infrastructure in his 2018 keynote address. In China's 2018 FOCAC commitment, connectivity infrastructure was listed as the number two priority among the eight action plans, focused mostly on hard infrastructure projects on the ground. So, Kobus, there we have it. The pullback from China on infrastructure, the need is tremendous. Where do you think we stand right now in this infrastructure debate? I think we we should tread carefully um, <laughs> wherever we're standing. Um, the I think that the you know the the as you say you know when when you said in the intro that that um, that China is pulling back from the in, the infrastructure financing game. 
I might want to like add a few qualifiers there. One, one being that what what China might be stepping away from is it's the dominant model for infrastructure financing that we've seen demonstrated in Africa over the last twenty years, which is a, a very, you know, kind of like. China SOE driven, uh, like state owned enterprise driven, um, policy bank financed, kind of Sino sure insured, kind of mega infrastructure project model. Um, we're seeing this kind of rapid diversification of Chinese lenders. Um, the, we're seeing also the the announcement of of all of these different projects, you know, kind of in 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 the the the, the, the Xi Jinping speech and the, the Dakar Action Plan. Um, that raise interesting questions about, like, if if China is stepping away from infrastructure, then what do these projects represent? For example, um, they listed ten connectivity projects and ten digital connectivity projects. So, with the connectivity projects, you know, kind of, if they, if like, what kind of connectivity projects are these are these going to be if they're not? some form of connectivity infrastructure projects. So so I, I very much take Yun Sun's point and I think I think you know she 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 she's she's like I, I largely agree with her. What I was wondering about though is how much of the kind of language around infrastructure was like how many of these those kind of changes were reflecting political pressures and how many of those were reflecting investment decisions um you know and, and and i think we'll only really once we once we see what these particular projects represent we'll have a closer idea um you know so i i i I tend to I don't necessarily think that the China stepping away from this kind of like this model that I outlined before the you know kind of the the state on enterprise et cetera et cetera that kind of like that model that that has become dominant China stepping away from that model doesn't necessarily mean that China stepping away from infrastructure financing in Africa you know those are two different things and they may well like what the one thing that 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 I was that I found intriguing about FOCAC this year is that it seems to be opening a space for a lot of kind of new forms of financing new forms of engagement some form of like there seems to be spaces for innovation within with you know kind of like woven into the language and so you know kind of i'm very interested to see whether any of those actually then translate into infrastructure i think i think that still remains very unclear so that's a very important distinction to make, and I'm glad you made that distinction, that it's not that China's backing away entirely from infrastructure, it's just they're backing away from the policy bank-led, mega, massive, multi-billion dollar projects like the Standard Gauge Railway in Kenya, for example. But one of the things that we've been tracking quite regularly over the past year is that there are a lot of announcements of much smaller projects in the 10 million, 20 million, 100 million, which are in fact still funded by the policy banks, by the China Exim Bank, but also now funded by state-owned enterprises. We're seeing the introduction of Chinese venture capital and private enterprise coming into it. And so there's a lot of different models out there. Two points that I want to put on the, on, on the table today for our discussion, and we're going to talk to our guest today about it, is new funding models. So there's one that's happening in Kenya right now, a very important test. We've talked about this previously on the show in the form of the Nairobi Expressway. Anybody in Nairobi right now knows exactly what a nightmare the Nairobi Expressway is because it is just snarled traffic throughout the capital. But outside of Nairobi, people may not be following this very closely. It's a 27-kilometer four-lane toll road that will go from Jomo Kenyatta International Airport down to the Central Business District and off to the Westlands area. It's about a half a billion dollars, maybe $600 million to build it. It's a public-private partnership between the Kenyan government and the China Road and Bridge Corporation. The China Road and Bridge Corporation, CRBC, may sound familiar to you. That's the same company that built the Standard Gauge Railway, and they've been doing a lot of construction in Kenya. So that's one test that we should keep our eyes on. There's another one out in Nigeria at the port of Lekki where China Merchant Holdings has made a, an equity stake in the project. So again, we're seeing a very different model. I think they put $200 million into building West Africa's uh, largest deep, deep water port there. So that's again a different financing model where they have an equity stake. So we'll look to that. Let's get a perspective right now on infrastructure, where it's going, where the needs are, and get the kind of on-the-ground view of it all. We're so thrilled to have on the program for the first time Johnson Kilangi, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Lean Africa Consultants Limited. He's also the founder of the Africa Project Finance Program, which is a training initiative that helps to foster 
infrastructure finance leaders on the continent. Johnson, a very good afternoon to you in Nairobi, and thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you very much, Eric, for having me on board uh, in today's podcast. It's wonderful to have you and to get this expert view because we've seen a lot of talk about African infrastructure. We've seen a lot of these new initiatives coming out of the U.S. and Europe and even Japan to some extent. But let's start our discussion to get a sense of where we are in terms of the need. We've heard a lot of scary numbers about the falling in infrastructure finance. So where are we right now in terms of the scope and the need? And give us a lay of the land in your neck of the woods in East Africa, but also across the continent in terms of what's the most acute need for infrastructure and what's the scenario? Thanks, Eric. I think just to put this uh, discussion into into perspective, we need to understand uh, where we were about three decades ago, uh, where we are currently now and where Africa wants to go, you know, in the next five decades or so. So three decades ago, of course, um, there was much needed uh, infrastructure in the, in the African continent. If you looked at the East African region, most of the African governments were looking forward to, to avail, you know, the basic infrastructure, you know, infrastructure connecting uh, basic, you know, the cities across uh, the Af- East African countries. A case in example is Kenya. Uh, we didn't have, you know, a good connection between the port of Mombasa and Nairobi all the way to, to Malaba. So that was the situation. And at that time, actually, what we were looking for is a quick solution to be able to finance the much needed infrastructure uh, that these countries needed. But fast forward, of course, uh, 20 years down the line, um, the reality has dawned on us. Of course, we need to service these debts uh, that we took in order to finance uh, this infrastructure. Of course, we are feeling the heat, and quickly uh, there is a renewed uh, need uh, to be able to undertake thorough feasibility studies even before we can be able to approach potential lenders uh, for to finance most of these projects. So that is where we are currently are. Uh, you know, most of the countries in the region um, are actually scaring at uh, unbearable debt levels. Um, And this is majorly because most of these countries had hugely borrowed uh, to finance uh, infrastructure, especially the road, uh, railway, and and water transport. So going forward, what I expect to to, to happen is that most of the countries now are a bit cautious uh, because there is need for us to be sure what kind of investment we need to borrow uh, to be able to finance our projects. And that is why you see there is more focus into the private participation in, in infrastructure projects so that governments can be able to breathe and allocate uh, more of, of the budget to other much uh, pressing needs, especially around health, you know, water and sanitation. So that is where we are. That is where we are going as, 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 as the region. And this is purely from my personal uh, perspective. Um, COVID-19, of course, came in to interrupt a lot uh, uh, the, the investment strategy around infrastructure. Um, in the Kenyan setup, I've seen a review of the infrastructure project pipeline, uh, and I think that has been advised majorly because of what we have been able to learn because of COVID-19. Uh, you'll appreciate that yesterday, uh, the, the president of the Republic of Kenya assented into law, the public-private partnership bill of 2021. And the idea is to bring into place a robust regulatory framework that will give the much needed confidence to the private sector so that they can invest more in infrastructure projects going forward. So that is a signal that going forward, we're going to see less of the borrowing that we had seen in the last three decades. And we're going to focus more uh, on private sector-led initiatives into infrastructure projects. But as we know, this is not um, uh, it's going, it's not going to be a walk in the path. In the park, of course, it's, it's difficult. We need to work on housekeeping issues to make sure that we inculcate a conducive environment that will attract the private sector investment into infrastructure. So that is how I look at it. Um, going forward, uh, I expect to see less of flows, especially from the traditional uh china into africa uh because uh, also africa i think china 
um, is, you know, realigning its strategy uh, because of a few mishaps that they've gone through in terms of the investment that they've put in the African space. I was wondering if you if you could talk a little bit more about this this you know, public private partnership bill that, that is coming in. What which particular measures um, is it taking to to I- increase private sector confidence? So one of the main highlights, uh, and and I think this would be very interesting uh, for investors, is that for once we are going to see the subnational governments, which are the county governments, being allowed to enter into public private partnership agreements with the private sector. So ideally, we have a chance now to identify and package smaller and more impactful uh, projects at the county levels, which are going to be closer to the people. And I think that is a good opportunity for the investors to take advantage of. And so I expect this new piece of legislation to be a huge enabler into sparring investment in the county levels. So that will go a long way into improving the lives of the people, you know, creating the much needed jobs for the youth in the county levels. And of course, ultimately that boils down to, you know, growth in the entire um, uh, Kenyan country. And of course, the other thing is that um, we are going to see more and more private participation, uh, local participation in this in these projects. So I expect to see more of unsolicited proposals coming from, Kenyan company, companies or entities incorporated in Kenya uh, to uh, governments, of course, at national and sub, uh, subnational level. So that is another important thing because one of the issues uh, we've had before is, you know, the inability to be able to identify um, innovative and impactful uh, solutions that can be driven, especially coming from uh, the government side. So. This new piece of legislation allow more of this to come uh, from the private side and, of course, from the local uh, entities. And I see a lot of interest already, you know, in trying to make sure that the subnational governments are well positioned to be able to uh, to take advantage of this uh, new initiative that will really help in propelling uh, investment into the county levels. You've talked about the Chinese, you've talked about the national governments and even the subnational governments. I'd like to get your take on what you think of all of these initiatives coming out of the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere uh, about infrastructure in places like Kenya. What's your take on Build Back Better World and the Global Gateway and some of these programs? I have heard a lot about this, but my only problem is we don't see this translating into good projects in Africa. And I think one of the reasons is that we've not positioned ourselves to be able to take advantage of these pools of investment that are being packaged for, especially for the emerging uh, markets. So there is need for Africa to quickly position themselves uh, to be able to attract these funds. And one of the ways we can be able to do this is to be able to come up with a long-term infrastructure strategic planning so that we can be able to send a signal out to the market that we already have a plan, a long-term plan that wants to improve uh, the lives of Africa. That has been missing. In fact, in my opinion, what we've been doing is actually firefighting, you know, trying to fix uh, pieces of infrastructure in all the places because we had a huge backlog of infrastructure to, to, to fill. So that is what we need to do as Africa. And then, of course, break that down into mid-term goals and identify strategic partners we can be able to work with. Uh, I don't think Africa is the same uh, three decades ago. Slowly, there's a movement towards uh, doing innovative projects in a sustainable way, uh, undertaking thorough feasibility studies, because we've burnt our fingers for long. And, of course, with the huge debt levels, we do not have an option. We have to make sure that we invest more in building uh, bankable projects that can attract investment, especially from the, some of these funds. Of course, the issue of capacity building has been a thorn in the flesh for some time. Um, we have complained a lot that we don't have the capacity to be able to structure good projects, but I'm seeing a lot of initiatives around trying to impact practical skills around infrastructure financing and development. You've mentioned about our Africa Project Finance Program, and the idea is to be able to build champions 
uh, that can be able to influence how we conceptualize structure, finance, and implement infrastructure projects going forward. So I see some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you see some good projects being uh, implemented across Africa. Recently, there was an, an update that Kenya was ranked the first in terms of delivering projects financed by China ahead of time, uh, I mean, across the entire globe. Um, I mean, despite the issues that we have, I think that is something to appreciate because it goes a long way into showing how we've improved in terms of our preparedness to handle uh, and implement this project. So there's a lot of improvements going on. And I think this is just a signal to the potential investors. We are consolidating our position so that going forward, we can be able to work with other partners in a sustainable way. You know, in, in relation to the US and, and European initiatives, um, have you seen any kind of details about which particular projects they might be financing? You know, um, is there is there a kind of a is there any kind of guidelines or any kind of indications emerging at the moment that that would allow governments in Africa um, to position themselves in in order to to bid for some of this money, or is or is it still like is that still lying far in the future? Uh, Kobus, you've, you've talked about projects. I think the immediate project that has attracted European investment uh, is the Rironi uh, Mao Summit um, Expressway. I think we're talking about $1.7 billion uh, investment through public private partnership. And the idea is to open up the entire of the East African region by enhancing connectivity. And this is a project that is going to kick off uh, in a month or so. And, and I think um, going forward, we are going to see more of, of this interest, especially from the European uh, and, and the American side. But uh, the way these projects have been conceptualized and, of course, the public engagement, in my opinion, is slightly different. And that speaks to how these different silos of investors perceive you know, African investment, especially around infrastructure delivered through the public-private partnership. So that is one that I can quickly mention because it's in the public domain uh, and all this information is available uh, online. Public-private partnerships sound great on the surface because governments don't have to assume debt. The risk is spread out a little bit more and it's very appealing, especially right now when debt levels in many African countries, including your own, are running very, very high. But they're not meant for everything because in some ways there's a different pressure put on because investors want a faster return on investment. So they're going to charge tolls, they're going to charge fees, and that goes right to the consumer oftentimes that has to pay more. That's one of the concerns about the Nairobi Expressway is the toll fares, from my understanding, are going to be dynamic. So depending on the valuation of the dollar, depending on traffic loads, the price for using the, the Nairobi Expressway may fluctuate a little bit. That causes a little bit of anxiety to some consumers. But CRBC, fairly, wants their money back, okay? So PPPs work in some contexts like toll roads, maybe even railroads, where there's a transaction and revenue can be derived very quickly. But it doesn't work in all situations. Can you maybe lay out for us where PPPs offer the most potential and where there's no other way government has to fund certain kinds of infrastructure because the private sector just isn't interested, say, in sewage systems or other types of infrastructure like that. That's true, Eric. I mean, I, I mean, on paper, public-private partnership sounds very simple. But on the ground, this can be a complicated initiative to, to implement. I think for you, I mean, just to paint a picture on this, we need to appreciate some of the inherent challenges that we have as Africa that first have to be addressed before we can be able to implement uh, PPP projects uh, going forward. Uh, issues around local uh, inability of the local market to un unlock financing for these projects, the risk profile that we have. Of course, the skewed uh, allocation of risk, which is a huge problem still in, in this uh, part of the world. Uh, and of course, a number of issues, uh, political risks. So. First of all, you have to appreciate some of these challenges and then see what do we want to achieve as a government. I've talked about the long-term strategic planning around infrastructure. 
what is it that we want to achieve in the long term in terms of implementing infrastructure projects? And what is the ideal uh, model of procuring and financing these projects? In my opinion, um, we cannot be able to find, uh, to procure large infrastructure projects, especially those that will levy tolls to the users at the current state we are. There's need for us to start small and build capacity as we proceed. Perhaps start with projects whereby government is able to chip in and pay the private investors in the form of availability payments just to send a signal that we are building the requisite uh, experience to be able to manage uh, this project. And of course, commitment is very key. We need to assure investors that we are committed to ensuring that we pay up uh, the investment until completion. So that is very important thing for us to, 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 to put into perspective. And then, of course, going forward, um, can we consider now scaling up uh, to charge tolls uh, so that in the event these projects don't go well, then we can manage the risks as a country. We don't want to be in a situation whereby we start implementing huge projects through PPPs, they fail, then we even uh, abolish that model of procurement of infrastructure just because we did not get it right from the beginning. So my always advice is let's start small, uh, let's think big, let's think of uh, sectors where we keenly need to leverage on the private sector uh, to, to drive those projects. We have so many challenges around the water and sanitation uh, sector. I don't see any investment or projects uh, being procured through PPPs in this sector. I expect to see government pumping uh, more um, support so that we can attract private investment into these areas, especially in the wake of COVID-19. There's need for us to be able to avail clean and safe drinking water to the majority who do not even have access to water as we speak. So post-COVID-19, of course, I'm seeing PPP being used uh, for more sectors and like the traditional focus on road. Um, we're going to see more in the energy sector, water and sanitation, and even in the technology side, I expect to see more of uh, projects coming through uh, the PPP model. So we, we've spoken about the, all of these different changes in, in financing and evolution of financing models of Chinese uh, projects. Do you have a, a sense of whether the Chinese projects have evolved in Africa in, in other respects? For example, in relation to, to environmental impact assessments, in relation to skills transfer or the way that they kind of deal with local communities. Do you get a sense of that, that Chinese projects uh, project managers or, you know, different Chinese entities working in Africa that they are learning, and also, of course, African authorities, that all, that both sides are kind of learning from experiences and failures of the past? Or is it is it a kind of a more of a mixed bag? I think, of course, there's, there's a lot of progress in that line. I've seen uh, the Chinese companies working closely more than ever before with the procuring authorities to enhance capacity of uh, the local uh, people in projects that they're implementing. A case in example is uh, the SGR. I think uh, quite a number of engineers were sent to China uh, to be able to learn and appreciate, uh, you know, what goes behind to drive uh, those mega infrastructure projects. And I think there's also an awakening, an awakening on the side of the local procuring authorities uh, because they package uh, these projects now to include a budget specifically for training the local community, perhaps where the the infrastructure project traverses. And I think this is a great improvement because once the project is implemented, we have left behind a pool of trained professionals who can be able to work with local companies to enhance capacity uh, in the country. So yes, there's uh, quite some good improvement, but I think partly it has been due to the pressure by the local uh, for the Chinese companies to see some of these benefits to the Locals. I'm glad you brought up the standard gauge railway in Kenya. You're in Kenya. You're very familiar with the project. It's a very controversial initiative. Cost about $6 billion to build. Lots of people say, listen, you, we're not going to pay this back the same way that the Americans, the Germans, the French, the British, they've been running deficits on their railway systems. That's what countries do. They build a railway so that it generates larger economic activity and then the society as a whole benefits. Other people say, well, the financing of the SGR in particular 
was done poorly. The feasibility studies were done poorly. Uh, there were cheaper, more effective ways of financing this thing so it could be done better, much like what Tanzania is doing by using private capital rather than state capital from China. Talk to us about what the key lessons learned from the standard gauge railway that we might be able to apply to other projects as you see it from the financing point of view. Yeah, as you mentioned, this is a controversial project. And um, I always say, uh, if I've been asked whether we needed the standard gauge railway, my answer is definitely a yes. So we needed to connect the port of Mombasa uh, all the way to Uganda so that we can enhance connectivity in the region. But it didn't go to Uganda. It stopped in Naivasha. So is that still useful, even if it doesn't go all the way to Uganda? Yes, we needed it connected all the way to Uganda, but that did not happen. And I think why it did not happen you know, speaks to some of the challenges we are actually trying to address uh, in this uh, program. Um, the financing mechanism, uh, perhaps I will not agree with how it was financed, but of course, I understand the government had certain limitations, and that is why it opted uh, for that model at that time. But going forward, perhaps for the last stretch connecting to Uganda, I'll advise for a more robust financing model that perhaps might involve local participation, because that is the only way we can be able to build capacity, not only on the side of the private sector implementing, but also on the local financing uh, system, you know, they'll be able to evaluate better going forward if they're given a chance to be involved in some of these projects. So I think, yeah, I stopped somewhere in Vasha, but I think the implementing authority has connected this SGR to the meter gauge railway. And uh, I think in early January, we should be able to connect all the way to Uganda uh, via railway. So these are some of the issues that I've said that we need to handle, we need to address. But it depends with where we are. Perhaps there was no option at that time. Perhaps there was, there was no you know, acceptance by the local financial market to invest in such a project. And perhaps that is why the government was forced to go that way. But we have more options going forward. I think we have a robust PPP law that can spur local investment to be able to finish the last leg of the SGR to connect to, 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 to Uganda. But then you can clearly tell why we need to, to reinvent and have a robust long-term infrastructure strategy because that will speak to how we are going to finance our projects in the future. So there will be clarity, even for the new uh, politicians who will be coming in on board from president all the to, to lower level, they will clearly understand what needs to be implemented. Those are my thoughts, and these are personal views on, on the SGR. And I think there will be more and more debate along this project going forward, especially on how it can be financed. You know, pivoting a little bit to a different kind of infrastructure, um, uh, uh, you know, several African countries were, were, I think, caught a little bit unawares when, when um, Xi Jinping announced um, earlier this year that, that China is going to stop uh, financing coal power. And, you know, particularly Zimbabwe and South Africa, you know, we, we like I think a lot of politicians were, were not happy with that. So we, we, we covered in, in our newsletter, we covered uh, a recent report uh, by the African Climate Foundation, which said that, that you know, the, even though there's been a lot of a lot of financing uh, from Europe, from the US, from, you know, from, from traditional donors and from China, kind of there's a lot of, of, of financing being allocated for. For, uh, for renewable energy, um, that many African countries don't actually have projects ready to go. And so I was wondering what your impression is, um, you know, about that um, and, and about what it takes to have, to, to, de to develop projects and to have them kind of ready to go when, when the kind of financing train comes by. Yeah, I think um, the issue of uh, coal and of course renewable energies is, is a great discussion. And you know where Kenya as a country stands, we, we are the leaders in renewable energy in Africa, and of course, eighth uh, globally. Um, and I think China's decision to, 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 to stop funding coal, I mean, came at the right time, uh, because um, as much as other countries will make noise about it, I think we all have as, uh, renewable sources of energy. You can drive in Africa and you'll appreciate the, the weather we have in Africa. So if you don't have the, the sun, of course, you have wind, you have geothermal. So I think we need to push ourselves extra hard 
to be able to identify some of these sources so that we can be able to attract a sustainable financing for these projects. So looking forward now into 2022 and maybe even into 2023, We've talked about that there are some very serious debt issues that many countries like Kenya are grappling with, so it's going to be difficult to raise money from traditional sources like the bond markets or taking loans from the likes of the Chinese. Where will the money come in the short term, or where would you like the money to come from in the short term? Where do you think it's best to finance these infrastructure needs and to help close that massive infrastructure deficit that is plaguing so many countries on the continent? I think it would be best if the politicians can can speak the truth because truth be told, we are still going to borrow. I mean, in the short term, five years, 10 years, we are still going to borrow because uh, as much as we are propelling public-private partnerships uh, in Africa, it will take time before we can see a good size of projects through uh, the PPP model. Of course, we need to work on the local financing market to unlock financing locally, but that takes time. So I see ourselves borrowing um, so what the focus should be is to try and see how can we expand our tax base so that we can collect more and more money by expanding our economies, creating more jobs, uh, so that we can sustain the pace uh, that we've already created in terms of infrastructure development. Simultaneously, the flow of capital or investment into infrastructure, especially from the private sector. Uh, but we need to speak with some level of honesty uh, and a commitment because nobody is going to invest in a country where they cannot see uh, some commitment from some of the senior uh, ministries. So that has to happen. But in the short time, we are still borrowing to finance uh, projects. And is there a big difference in terms of borrowing domestically versus borrowing internationally? I'm convinced that the local market can uh, can finance a good size of projects that we're implementing. We're talking about $100 million, $200 million, $300 million dollars. Uh, projects. These are projects that can be locally financed. The question is, how do we consolidate this local financing and channel them to infrastructure projects? I think that is the billion dollar question that we need to tackle and and a number of flow in local investment into infrastructure. Johnson Kilangi is the founder and chief executive officer of Lean Africa Consultants Limited and also the founder of the Africa Project Finance Program, a training initiative that helps foster infrastructure finance leaders in Africa. Johnson, thank you so much for helping to clear a lot of this up. It's a fascinating topic. There's a lot going on. You guys have a lot going on, and you are very active on Twitter. If people want to find out more about what you're doing and want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? I think the the first way is to contact us. Uh, We're very active on LinkedIn. We have the Africa Project Finance Program. You can contact us via email, info at leanafricaconsultant.co.uk. We'll definitely get give them feedback as, as fast as possible. We are out here to create real change in Africa. Uh, we are convinced that uh, we need to create champions who can influence how infrastructure financing is implemented in Africa in future. I love that. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes. Johnson, thank you again. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Eric. It was a great pleasure. Thanks, Cobus. Cobus, I really hope folks from the White House and people in Brussels and London were listening to what Johnson had to say and how he didn't really have an enormous amount of enthusiasm or excitement for all of these new initiatives for infrastructure spending. I was actually expecting him to think, wow, there's a lot of money coming into the pipeline now to offset what China's been doing and we want to do this. And he didn't seem that turned on by it all. And he wants to focus more on domestic financing and self-sufficiency. And I love that. I think it's great. But it did take me by surprise a little bit that he wasn't more excited about B3W, Global Gateway. And I get the sense that he just maybe doesn't believe it's going to happen. Well, I think it's still very early days, you know. So so I think once once we know more specifically what what these programs will, what kind of projects they'll, they'll support, and you know how much of that support is going to be in Africa, and what the terms are. Then I think it's you know kind of it, it becomes a, m- a more real conversation. But but you know kind of no matter what, what kind of development we find on, on that side, um, I completely agree with him that that developing the the kind of domestic financing capability of African countries is key. It's it's key anyway. No matter no matter what happens with with these initiatives, and, and actually no matter what happens with China's China's presence in Africa. 
um, you know, kind of like that. That is that is a, that will be like being being able to, to kind of mobilize that kind of financing will give African countries a level of control over their own development plans that's unprecedented. You know, kind of and and that that would actually completely like like rebalance their relationship with external donors in a in a much more healthy way. I think. Yeah, and it's very interesting, this idea of financing it more domestically, because, and he brought this up in our conversation before we went on the air, we didn't get to it during our our on-air conversation, but he talked about how if you're borrowing in shillings or you're borrowing in rand, and then you're paying back the debt in shillings or rand, then you don't have to worry about the depreciating currency and the currency conversion issues the same way that you do now when you borrow in dollars or euros. And that's a very important issue right now simply because the value of the shilling has fallen about 3% this year. The SETI in Ghana is under pressure. Uh, We've been reporting quite a bit on other African currencies that are under pressure. And so if these loans come in in dollars, then it costs more to borrow abroad. So borrowing more domestically is great. The key question right now is that you look in South Africa, is domestic saving rates are quite low and the consumer is under pressure. That means the pension funds are under pressure. So those pools of capital domestically are being burdened by the ongoing economic uncertainty in Africa. So I wonder if there's going to be enough capital available to be able to do that. I don't say that negatively. I'm just curious whether or not the consumer and the savings rates are sufficient to fund as much infrastructure as is needed. Yeah, it's. I think it's a really important issue, and of course, you know, it it, it very much depends on the kind of time horizon when one is looking at, and and in the in the near near term, all of this has, is so fundamentally affected by COVID, um, you know, and therefore the the kind of impact that that issues like, for example, like vaccine access. Um, and and refusal to to waive vaccine intellectual property that we're seeing from from many Western countries, you know, kind of is, has direct developmental impacts. Um, it, it has direct impacts on issues like, for example, how, like how many migrants decide to go to Europe or not. Um, and one has to note that um, you know not not to not to engage in what about them, but but one of the points that the Xi Jinping made in his his FOCAC speech was that they are actually willing to waive IP. Um, on, on, on Chinese vaccines. So, I'll kind of believe that when I see it, to be honest with you, though. Yeah, you know, but still, he said it, you know, so so it's, you know, all of these all of these things are kind of hanging in the air. Um, but the thing is, I think, you know, in, in the end, like the the planning has to happen anyway. Um, you know, so so the African governments have to have to find ways of, of, of drawing on these domestic resources and increasing their domestic kind of um, domestic, uh, you know, kind of ta- uh, tax collection for example all of these things have to those systems have to be sharpened up anyway so you know so, so in that sense I think you know all of these pressures are actually causing or may may well spur you know kind of some form of like do, kind of domestic reform in Africa that that is long overdue do you have any idea how global gateway and build back better world are going to overcome the challenge of funneling billions of dollars for infrastructure into Africa, but they say they're not going to create the same debt burdens that the Chinese have. A lot of the Chinese concessional lending is quite affordable, 2%, 3% interest. We were talking to one of our contacts who, who does some of this finance work in China, and he was pointing out that the Entebbe airport loan that's been of such controversy over the past two, two or three weeks was a 2% loan. And it was quite low, those concessional rates. And I'm just wondering, do you have any insights on how the Europeans in the U.S. are going to funnel that much money to Africa and yet still not add to the loan burden? I I just haven't figured that out. It's a very, very important and interesting question, and I have no idea. I was thinking the same thing. I was wondering, are they going to be giving more grants? Or are they going to be rooting it in a different way? It's going to be fascinating. I think we, you know, kind of as as soon as we can get someone, you know, close to those initiatives kind of on the podcast, that would be the first question I want to ask them. Yeah, it's that. And then they've talked about this transparency. They're going to be transparent. And at this point right now, neither the United States or European governments have been particularly transparent with their concessional lending or their ex and bank loans. So it's going to be a big shift for them to open up their books. And I think it'll be fascinating for researchers to finally see what these loans actually look like. The pressure's on them to be transparent. 
And boy, if they are anything but fully transparent, they're going to come under a just a wave of criticism for hypocrisy. So I'm hoping that we're going to be able to see something totally new in the financing space. Maybe they'll do it more like what the Development Finance Corporation's doing, DFC, where they'll make investments. So that way it's not a loan. It'll be interesting. I'm very curious to see what they come up with because there's a lot of hype, a lot of talk, but it's going to be something that is very interesting to follow. We are going to follow infrastructure very closely in the year ahead because this is a critical moment for so many African countries and for China as well. As China looks inward to deal with its own economic issues, it is going to be spending less, but it's going to be spending in a much more tactical way. So again, look for the themes that President Xi announced at FOCAC and in the action plan when they talked about green power, they talked about digital infrastructure. So we're going to see a lot there. As Kobus pointed out, there's going to be a lot of talk in terms of different financing sources, so not coming from the China Development Bank or the China Exim Bank, but from state-owned enterprises private investors from municipal uh, state municipal enterprises all sorts of different entities will be involved in the financing space it's going to get a lot more complicated one of the things that we have seen coming out of focac is how difficult it is for journalists to really understand these narratives and we've been doing good takes and bad takes i talked about this in the last show There are so many good takes that are coming out, and there are so many bad takes coming out as well. The bad takes are in part because people just are not informed. That is the core reason why we produce the content that we do every single day, is to help you and journalists and analysts and policymakers and diplomats and corporate leaders to better understand this incredibly complex story. So if you'd like to find out what's going on, go to our website. You can check out all the content. We have an archive of about 4,000 articles now on the website, almost 700 shows. Can you believe that, Kovas? We're getting up to 700. It's crazy. And uh, so it's just an amazing resource for you to help you in your research Uh, If you want to subscribe, chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Subscriptions are super cheap, super affordable, 15 bucks a month, $149 a year. We really appreciate your support. And we also really are grateful to all of our Patreon supporters as well. We've got some cool things going on over on Patreon, a really great community. We're doing Zoom calls. We're giving uh, updates to folks during the week. And then every Friday, there is the weekly digest that goes out to our Patreon uh, followers there, patreon.com slash China Africa Project. Let's leave the conversation there. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another show. We've got only a couple more shows left for this year. Then we're going to have our year in review and year in preview show, and we'll take a quick little break at the end of the year for the holidays. So until next week, for Cobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. continues online head over to facebook.com slash china africa project to share your thoughts on today's show for more information about the china africa project go to chinaafricaproject.com